There are so many approaches. There are so many different strategies, how to buy low and sell high. There is moving averages. There's relative strength indicators. There's the MACD. There is support lines. There's resistance lines. What's actually working? Price is the result of demand versus supply. When demand goes up and supply stays stable, price goes up. When demand goes down or supply goes up, then the price goes down. The nice thing about Bitcoin is that the supply is known. We don't have to guesstimate where supply is going. We only have to look at demand. And for that, we can look at on-chain metrics. So here is how to not do things. You are not going to beat the market by drawing random lines, by trying to find out where support and resistances are, because those kind of lines always get broken and redrawn. You're also not going to make any money by using technical indicators that don't have any backtesting behind them. Who tells you that it really makes sense to sell whenever this turns red or to buy whenever this turns green? Who says that something like the moving average would work? And if you do use a moving average, what the right duration here is? Should it be the 200 day? Should it be the 100 day? Who knows? Most people, I believe, use those indicators the wrong way. I've done a back test on moving averages. Historically, the 120 day simple moving average worked the best for Bitcoin. But in this video, I want to focus on something else. Since the supply is known, let's have a look at demand. And everybody is talking about the demand by traditional finance, right? Through the Bitcoin ETFs. What's happening to that demand? And how much is that demand actually impacting the price let's look at the data so this is the total bitcoin etf balance measured in dollars and yes this went up quite a bit and now is fluctuating we had been at 61 billion at some point then went down to 52 billion now we are recovering again but there's actually a chart that's less volatile than that because a lot of that asset under management number is fluctuating because the price of bitcoin is fluctuating so instead of looking at the total etf balance in us dollars let's have a look at this measured in bitcoin and yes there was an increase of the bitcoin balance held by the etfs but that increase has halted since the middle of march for more than a month we don't see any absorption by the bitcoin etfs potentially supporting the price we don't see it anymore here are the videos that work on youtube xrp will be twelve thousand dollars guaranteed or an ai explosion top three cryptos to buy in november a lot of pushing of greed that's what gets the clicks what doesn't get the click is a tutorial on how to make back tests on how to build those sheets that in the end figure out what historically worked well in the past the back test that i often show here on this channel I still very much enjoy producing this kind of content though. I also share these kinds of sheets, but I don't do it on YouTube. You also get direct access to me. Feel free to check it out. It's thebitcoinstrategy.com. And so here is what many people say. There is of course an outflow from the grayscale Bitcoin trust. At the same time, we see inflows in all the other ETFs, especially BlackRock and Fidelity. And some people speculate that once the outflows out of GBTC stop, that then the other ETFs will take over in the end, creating net purchases. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. I believe a lot of the demand for those new ETFs is simply just reshuffling, reorganizing of funds from GBTC, the expensive GBTC, to the much less expensive, cheaper ETFs. And this is here why I think that's the case. See how there's quite a bit of correlation between the inflows into those various ETFs and the outflows from GBTC. So GBTC is in red, the inflows are all the other colored bars at the top. And whenever we see a lot of inflows, we don't see that many outflows from GBTC. Now we see very little outflows, but also very little inflows. So this suggests that the outflows are not completely independent from the inflows. So if the outflows out of GBTC completely stop, then it doesn't mean that the other ETFs will suddenly pick up the slack and the balance will go up. It didn't go up for more than a month already, even though the outflows are now slower than before. There is an interesting approach to trade those ETFs potentially, because the balance, the balance that's been held by the ETF versus the price that's been traded can somewhat vary across the days. There is a buying and selling at the end of the day, but especially within the day, there can be quite a bit of discrepancy. Have a look at the Bitcoin spot price in black and have a look at the price of those different 
ETFs. GPDC tends to be a bit more expensive than spot, but there are days where it's cheaper. So it might make sense to then buy, let's say on the 5th of March, to then sell on the 6th of March when we are above. So you can hedge yourself against this, right? You can simply just buy when we are undershooting, at the same time short Bitcoin on a decentralized application. So you're not exposed to the Bitcoin price risk. And then you're simply just trading the deltas. So you avoid buying GPTC over here, but you can buy it, let's say, over here. It's not a ton of money you can make with this, but maybe a percentage point here and there, there seems to be still a bit of inefficiencies in the market. And so how much do the Bitcoin ETFs really have an impact on the price? The chart behind me gives the answer. This is a return matrix. On the x-axis, we've got the ETF net flows. So we've got either inflows or outflows. On the y-axis, we've got the price performance of Bitcoin. And if there was a strong correlation between those two, we'd see a very clear line here, right? We would see only inflows when the Bitcoin price performance goes up and outflows when the Bitcoin price performance goes down. We do not see that. The correlation is very, very weak. Thus, I don't believe it's only the Bitcoin ETF demand that's moving the price. Because check this out. This is the trading volume of futures versus spot versus ETFs. There is a ton of trading volume in the futures market. Whenever the futures market is depressed, we tend to be very low in the price. When the futures market expands again, we tend to be very high in the price. So little futures trading volume is very good. You want to be buying at those lows. You don't want to be buying at the highs. But compare this, right? Compare this with the spot trading volume that's in dark orange and the ETF trading volume. The ETF trading volume is minuscule. And that explains why there's very little correlation between the returns of Bitcoin and the ETF net flows. The ETF trading volume simply doesn't matter that much. What matters most is the expansion and the contraction of leverage due to futures. Also have a look at the minor issuance, right? We can barely see this. That's here in turquoise. It's maybe one pixel on this chart. When people talk about the importance of the halving, that's what you're looking at. It's really nothingness in the grand scheme of things. And so what does matter in the end? It's of course futures trading volume, but it's also what the long-term holders are doing. Have a look at this. In red and in green, we can see the ETF chain. So in red are the outflows out of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. In green are the inflows into the other instruments. But have a look at this blue line, right? This has way more impact. This is the long-term holder supply chain. In other words, a lot of long-term holders recently sold. People that normally don't move their Bitcoin suddenly did. The spike was on the 28th of March in the Bitcoin price that's over here. It's very, very close to the all-time high. Now the long-term holder selling is slowing down. Once we are again close to zero, then it might make sense to get pretty deep into Bitcoin again, because then a lot of headwind is eliminated again. And so this is the indicator I like the most to determine whether or not we are currently heated and whether or not it makes sense to take profit. It's not a perfect indicator, but it does have some merit. Whenever this turns red, it might make sense to take some chips off the table. It turned red when Bitcoin was at around 20k, so that was equal to the prior high. Then we had another spike when Bitcoin was at 40k roughly and yes the long-term holders didn't sell that much afterwards anymore but still bitcoin only moved from 40k to 68k afterwards most of the rally that happened here was in the altcoin and we did see again this spike over here on the 28th of march so feel free to check that out right it's look into bitcoin.com the value that is destroyed multiple. This here has way more impact than the ETF demand. If it's your first time here, feel free to subscribe. I publish videos regularly. A like would be very much appreciated as well. It helps the channel grow. If you've got Telegram, feel free to join us. It's free. Link is down below.